Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Museum Technologies, Museum Transformations Conference. Um, judging from the attendance here at this early hour and the interest we've received by email, um, it seems that museums, like all the rest of us, are struggling with exploring and trying to master and make better use of the rapidly changing technological world that we all currently inhabit. And some of us are better prepared for that than others. Um, a number of things encouraged us at the Museum Studies program here at U of M to enter into these ongoing discussions by bringing together the scholars and practitioners you'll hear from today. Our first motivation uh, was anxiety. Uh, that as educators, we don't fully understand the very different ways that our students, hopefully all museum goers and museum leaders of the future, engage with objects, with collections, with the museum, and with each other, including through and with their digital devices, wherever and whenever they happen to be. Uh, and in ways that challenge the way museums have done things in the past and create new opportunities for us for the future. This conference was also inspired by some comments that today's conference discussant, Elaine Human-Gorian, made while filling the same role at a conference we held in this room almost exactly two years ago, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Museum Studies program. In her comments, Elaine advised us that as our program looks to its next 10 years, we need to pay close attention to the changes going on around us and need to think both practically and theoretically about institutional goals, institutional values, audiences, and about how museums and museum goers have the potential to expand forms of engagement and share authority and access uh, to foster new opportunities for self-discovery. And all of this means, among other things, uh, that we must be intelligent and directed users, shapers, and thinkers about the technologies we use, how we use them, and most importantly, why. And a third motivation for me as a uh, member of a program that is embedded in this particular institution with its many museums, and as a program that has the privilege to interact with so many partner institutions in the region, uh, I get the opportunity to witness some pretty impressive efforts at using technologies well and wisely, and also get to hear the other side of, we tried this and it didn't quite work, or we'd like to be doing something more, but we don't know quite what, quite what that is or how to make it happen. Uh, so the time seemed right to expand the conversation by bringing together a larger group of individuals from our neighborhood and from around the country uh, who are at the cutting edge of the digital transformations that are changing museums, museum work, and our world. And we're very honored to be able to provide a forum where these discussions can occur. We've had a lot of support in bringing this conference about, and I want to particularly acknowledge Bradley Taylor, MSP Associate Director, who's really the driving force behind this event. And I also want to thank the Museum Studies staff, Amy Smola, and our graduate assistant, Emma Sachs, who've overseen all of the logistics to make this event work, let's hope. Not, not helping me forget my jump drive this morning, showing I'm technologically challenged, but that's another story. Um, and also Nate Scott, who designed the program and our poster. And I want to thank our many co-sponsors from the University of Michigan for their generous support. The Institute for Humani the Humanities, the Department of the History of Art, the University Herbarium, the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology, the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, the Museum of Natural History, the Museum of Paleontology, the Museum of Zoology, the University of Michigan Museum of Art. See, when I said we had a riches of museums on this campus, and that's not even all of them, and the University Library. Um, before we start, a few business items. Um, all conference abstracts and presenter biographies are up on our website, so those are available to you. And as you can see, we are filming uh, this event, and uh, links to the, the video will be up on our website, and will be posted on YouTube in, um, as we say, where I work in India, in good time. Uh, 
And uh, because we are filming this conference, uh, we ask that if you have questions <clears throat> or comments during the discussion period uh, that will end each session, please wait until we can get a microphone to you so we can capture your, your comments. Uh, coffee breaks and this evening's reception are directly across the hall uh, in the assembly hall. And while I'm afraid we can't feed all of you lunch, uh, we have pulled together a list of restaurants that we can make available to you for those who are coming in from out of town. And with that business, I am delighted to introduce our first speaker, Peter Adamczyk. Uh, Peter is the program manager at the Google Cultural Institute. He holds undergraduate degrees in mathematics and computer science and graduate degrees in human factors, which I want to know what that is, uh, and library and information science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He began his career as an analyst at the Metropolitan Museum of Art before becoming data lead for the Google Art Project, and he now serves on the content team of the Google Cultural Institute. His work is focused on open, linked data and cultural heritage institutions. Um, Peter is an author, he's been a resident scholar at a number of institutions, and he's a frequent speaker and workshop organizer. His lecture today is entitled, Google Digitizing Culture? Question mark. And please join me in welcoming Peter Adamczyk. So just really quickly, thanks everybody for making it out early. Uh, I will show a quick video, just a minute and a half, just to give you a, a teaser of what the art project and ultimately what the Cultural Institute has become, but uh, just a, a good place and usual Google wow video sort of thing. about a year and a half ago with 150 collections, we're rapidly approaching uh, 500 institutions in about 58 countries. Um, we'll talk about that in just a bit. But again, thank you everybody uh, for making it out this morning. The crowd isn't quite as full, but still, it's very nice to see everybody. Um, this is one of the images we have from the Life uh, collection in the Cultural Institute um, of an Ann Arbor movie premiere uh, back in 1949. Quite an interesting set of faces in the audience. <laughs> People are watching very different films. I'm not sure if they're all actually watching the same thing, but. <laughs> um, I did start at the Metropolitan Museum of Art after a very kind of technical education. And I had a, a, an expectation of joining the museum where the curators would just be, you know, peeling back the curtains and everything would be beautifully organized and, and ready to go. And I would just be able to come in and, you know, put everything online and it would be a breeze. Not so much. Um, the realities of museum data, uh, the fact that I spent most of my time kind of dealing with uh, SQL tables and uh, trying to figure out how to make connections between, you know, uh, handwritten notes and uh, loosely documented uh, object records um, kind of drove me a bit batty. Um, and I'll show you some of the projects that I ended up with um, still at the Met. But 
ultimately, I was leaving the museum for a, a PhD when Google came around for the first round of the art project and uh, put me through the interview ringer, and I ended up uh, working on the back-end systems, all the metadata, all the imaging work that has to go into putting those collections online. Um, at the time, it was 17 museums, and that was uh, two and a half years ago at this point. And currently, again, it's grown quite a bit. So to give you an idea, really what I'll be focusing on in the first half of the talk is just um, a quick overview of the Cultural Institute, because we've, of course, managed to keep it fairly quiet. Um, and for the second half, I'll be looking a little bit more about what it means when Google actually comes into a museum and uses the technology that we do and what it does to the collection, or what the experience might seem like, anyway. The Cultural Institute, as a, as a brand, uh, really came from three projects. It started with the Art Project, which focused on uh, museums themselves, the Archive Project, which was initially um, individual country teams would be approached by people like the Nelson Mandela Center for Memory, uh, Yad Vashem, various institutions that had Berlin Wall content, um, all asking for help digitizing that material and putting it online. And those various one-offs kind of grew into work we do with libraries and archives in addition to museums. And then the World Wonders Project, which was our partnership with um, UNESCO to kind of document world heritage sites. We send the trolley, the Street View trolley or the backpack team to these various locations and, and try to document them. Ultimately, there was enough kind of momentum behind all of these that um, they became the Cultural Institute. We all use the same um, kind of infrastructure at this point. To just give you a timeline, um, it's been a fairly rapid growth, especially on the art project side, again, from 17 to 150 and now about 500 institutions. Um, every two months or so, there's another 40 or so museums or, uh, in this point, you know, cultural institutions writ rather large um, that join, uh, that partner with Google. The rules there, uh, just to give you an idea in terms of how we, uh, what the rules are in terms of engagement, um, it's nonprofit, so 501c3s are the international equivalents, um, only posting copyright free and copyright cleared content. Um, there's no advertising on the site, there's no printing, there's no downloading, um, the, uh, there's no transfer of rights of the content to Google. We simply ask for a license to show it on the Cultural Institute site. We don't use it outside of the Cultural Institute site without explicit permission. Um, so really we see ourselves just as a vehicle for the content. Another uh, avenue for discovery of that material, the way that YouTube might be or um, Flickr or whatever uh, other online tool you might use. Um, the geographical distribution of the collections varies quite a bit. Uh, of course, uh, Europe and North America are very well represented. Asia is surprisingly growing very quickly. Um, I say surprisingly again because the digitization there is happening very rapidly. Um, Africa is still a, a little difficult for us just because the collections may be there, but the digitization isn't yet happening. Um, and South America is slowly, of course, also uh, coming online. But the diversity of the collections is it's fairly broad. I'll show you examples later on as well. Just to go through some uh, World Wonders cases, uh, we've been to Antarctica, uh, not just the exteriors, but also the interiors of some of these spaces, in this case, Scott's Hut. Um, but really, our <laughs> bread and butter, I suppose, is uh, incredible kind of architectural spaces. Um, you saw some of them in the video, and of course, you can explore all of these on the site. But um, what we do is we send a trolley that's roughly seven feet tall, uh, two feet square, a normal walking pace, uh, someone just follows, uh, walks through the galleries. And uh, we show up when the institution's either closed or at least closed to the public because we have to turn off the face blurring technology um, because of all the portraits and, sculpt and statues. <laughs> Otherwise, they'd all be blurred as we walk through. Um, then uh, we provide the images back to the institutions and then they can uh, blur out whatever regions they like, either for copyright or security reasons. There's some interesting cases in a little bit. Um, and also some remote places. In this case, a, a contemporary sculpture park in Brazil. Um, it's like something out of a James Bond kind of villain lair thing. It's incredible. You, you walk through and you f every corner you see another beautiful piece of sculpture. Um, and the Taj Mahal, along with 29 other um, archaeological sites in, in India, launched uh, just a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Um, in this case, the imagery wobbles a little bit because it was on a backpack. <laughs> so you kind of get a sense of the movement of the person as they're walking through the space. But again, each of these, I, I, I wish I could talk about 
all of the uh, ways in which the technology is transforming the experience, but every one of these examples you can spend quite a bit of time on. I mean, just thinking in terms of what the experience of going to the Taj Mahal is virtually and realizing that it's embodied in a person wearing a backpack rather than this, you know, very mechanized process that we do in other places. It's, it automatically becomes something very different. But. Um, and of course, places like the White House, um, which grant us access in, in different ways. So the other, one of the other aspects um, to the project is gigapixels. Um, so you're probably familiar with super high resolution photography, these gigapans where you can zoom in on a, on a street level um, from you know, a high rooftop and, and see the entire city. We've tried to do the same thing for individual artworks. And initially, I, I really did think it was a bit of a gimmick in terms of just trying to figure it out. This just gives you a slide. If you go to the site, of course, you can zoom in. But if you look at the moon in the upper right, this is the kind of uh, detail that we're talking about in terms of um, the kind of uh, cracks and the brush strokes level quality. Um, at this point, I still wasn't, it was still an interesting conservation tool maybe, but I couldn't really see the value until we started doing other kinds of pieces and really understanding that the when you get that close to the material, you could tell very different stories, and the curators were enabled to tell different stories because of it. So this, again, is the kind of image that you might see of this priestly robe from Vienna, 15th century. And granted, if you had a slightly higher resolution image, you could, of course, spend some time talking about the individual figures and the composition and all the rest of it. But if you get this close, you've got issues around, well, each of the threads is woven in gold. Um, they've sourced pearls somewhere. Um, they've, you know, inlaid uh, gems and all the rest of it. I mean, there's all sorts of issues of labor and, you know, where all this content is coming from and, and how long it really took to make. And you, there's a very different way you can talk about the object when you get this close to it. And it's really about those kinds of narratives in these gigapixels that really kind of convinced me anyway that it was something worthwhile. I mean, in this, uh, the Tower of Babel, of course, you've got little vignettes in every little window. Um, you can spend hours on, on just this object alone. And that's kind of the third aspect of the project, is that we've been focusing on the storytelling component. So the hardest part for us is um, that we still don't do the digitization ourselves in terms of we still rely on the institutions to have that material already available for use. Um, so we've been spending our time now building tools that let people translate the physical exhibitions online. So again, translating that content directly or coming up with ways for them to set up virtual exhibitions. Um, either sharing across institutions or uh, just creating shows that they couldn't otherwise show. Um, it, just to give a couple of quick examples, I mean, it's a very broad group of exhibits at this point. From the, that was a photography museum in Brazil. Here we have the National Library of Ireland. And what it is here, the tool is painfully simple. It, it's just a, a drag and drop um, sort of interface on top of a templated um, film strip sort of presentation. So here you'll notice um, there's a, a left to right sort of scrubber um, that does a very simple sort of linear narrative that you're able to break up into different panels the way that you would um, just in a simple gallery experience. Um, or working on other formats that are letting institutions tell slightly more complicated stories and not just in this kind of very linear presentation. Um, again, for lack of a better term, kind of Ken Burns style. Um, zooming into individual objects and smaller text panels and moving on from one to the next where it's possible to kind of uh, lean back rather than kind of sit forward, I suppose, is the, the distinction between those two experiences. And I talked about the diversity of the institutions. This is one of my favorites. There's a small Hungarian literary museum um, that's taken advantage of it. You'll find on the site a very wide range of technical capabilities um, from the institutions that we've been working with. Um, everything from the largest institutions that are contributing, even my own Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, 80 objects maybe. But then you have smaller institutions that are contributing 2,000 and they just have the material ready and they'd like to be able to share it. Um, and other institutions that you know, have a staff of two people are uploading hundreds of items and you know, it, it's very disparate in terms of what it is that the institutions are trying to get out of this technology. Contemporary work obviously shows up quite a bit. Um, trying to document ephemeral uh, pieces or at least showing documentation of previous works. Um, this from Australia, the Caldor Public Art Projects, the ones that did um, in the upper left, for example, is uh, Christo's Wrapped Islands Project and uh, Gilbert and George and a Richard Long and so on. 
And what we're seeing is all of these initiatives, so that World Wonders, the archives, the museums, Gigapixels, all of it's kind of coming together for different institutions. So Versailles is a good example of this, where they focused on the building, they've done the grounds in Street View, they've done the actual interiors, um, as well as the archival collections and the museum collections. And it's giving a, a much more comprehensive sort of, uh, at least the content um, being displayed is more comprehensive than it has been in the past. When you start looking at across institutions, um, one of the things that we've noticed, of course, there are better books on Vermeer that show them all, of course, but we have 17 um, from various institutions out of, what, 32, 35 um, Vermeers? Um, and some of them are in, in wonderful resolution, of course, and I think at least one is a gigapixel. And you don't need to know, what, what we're finding interesting here in terms of the audience is that you don't need to know what institutions have the Vermeers. You might stumble across a Vermeer just by looking through the gallery of any one of these museums and you end up looking at all of them. It's a very simple kind of blunt but immediately kind of flattening uh, approach to collections that um, we still highlight the institutional distinctions in terms of saying that something's coming from one museum or the other, but the interface allows for very quick and easy kind of navigation across collections. And simple tools um, that we uh, have started building also in terms of comparison. Uh, right away, art historians and museum educators asked us for the side-by-side -side sort of comparison tool. And we started seeing these kinds of examples where without any coordination, so the sketch from the Cooper Hewitt on the right and the final painting from the Philadelphia Museum of Art on the left, and uh, things where archival material from one institution like the Morgan Library, where uh, Van Gogh sketches the bedroom and then the bedroom from, uh, from the museum. So let me switch gears a little bit. I mean, that was really a very quick uh, introduction to the Cultural Institute, but... <laughs> I couldn't help but find more um, Ann Arbor-based images before I, I uh, put the talk together today, and this was another fun one. Um, when Google comes to the museum, it's, it, you get very different reactions from different people, and I'll try to explain that, and especially how, how it is that our technology kind of reflects both our own, uh, Google's own approach to museums, and how museums maybe see themselves to some degree. To start this conversation, I'll show you one of the projects that I did at the Met in information visualization. So this graph here, it's got three dimensions. It's got medium up at the top, whether or not an object is on view, and these are only the objects on view, and then the date end, so the latest possible date for the object. And on top, you've got mediums like oil on canvas, marble, bronze. I think this is American decorative arts. And then the banding that happens down below is the distribution over dates. So for example, these are bronzes. Um, that, is, that are on view from 1906 make up 11.1% of the overall bronzes on view, things like that. But then I took a look at what's not on view, which is this whole chunk over here on the right compared to what is on view. And even the bronzes that you can see up here, the majority of them are on view. In this case, oil on canvas, they're not. But this crazy spaghetti over here on the right is what really freaked me out. <laughs> I mean, this is where the cataloging standards of an institution that's been around for 100 years kind of start breaking up. And that each one of these might have one slight little typographic difference that's causing the systems that we were trying to build to serve the access um, for the patrons um, that wanted to find this information just to break. There could be a semicolon in the wrong place or an M dash instead of an N dash or you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, and also just collapsing information to, into a single uh, database field. I mean, simple problems like that ended up with all of this content that either was never cataloged effectively by the, by the staff and then ultimately could never really be displayed as well as it could otherwise. And there's just so much of this um, going on. That level of abstraction is kind of where Google is happy to work, right? That for us, we're happy to be the people that save the digital image, the photograph, the text, maybe the chair and the clock eventually. But Google's approach is uh, moving away from the objects themselves and turning them into these data elements. And depending on how well we can handle those data elements is really how well we can display them. So the, it exposes all of the problems with cataloging. It deals with all of the issues that um, the museums face about why it is that certain objects are being shown and not shown. Why are certain things being accessioned or deaccessioned? 
um, how it is that the collection has formed over time. All of these things become, when technology no longer is the, display technology anyway, is no longer the issue, then it exposes all of the problems with the data underlying it, or at least that's been my experience the last few years. So for Google, really, it is just a, like, in this Boltansky piece, <laughs> um, it's just a lot of stuff. And we d can't uh, differentiate between a lot of it. We have a, a very much of a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, we have to handle 500 different cultural institutions, everybody from the football museum in Portugal to the Met to um, a rock art site in Australia. And we have to create a, a, a platform that will work for all of them rather than building custom solutions in each case. And that kind of all at once, all encompassing sort of sublime fire hose of content that, that Google provides, I mean, it turns into this wall of uh, a lot of information, but it still it, it lacks a lot of um, curatorial comment and interpretation, which is where, again, we have to rely on the institutions. Um, this is uh, just a, uh, interesting piece from uh, a gallery in Amsterdam. An artist printed out all of the Flickr photographs from one day and put them in the gallery. And you could walk around that space and, and enjoy it. Of course, it's a bit of a lie in that there are cardboard um, sort of sculptural supports underneath it. Um, and it's a little bit difficult, obviously, otherwise the piles would be unmanageable. But just as an idea, I mean, this is very much what the experience of the Cultural Institute has been so far, um, that we have to rely on a lot of linking data and um, institutional sort of agreement, which just doesn't exist. Um, they know the standards. Um, LIDO, uh, L-I-D-O, is one of the meta meta metadata standards that's present, um, that people are aware of, anyway. Out of the 500 institutions, more than a handful are know about it, but maybe only three or four have actually uploaded using that standard. Everyone else has fallen back on spreadsheets. And how far do you really want to fight that? I mean, in terms of if that's what people are using, maybe that's the technology that's appropriate. And those kinds of patterns, I suppose, are also, this is um, one of Lev Manovich's visualizations on Time Magazine covers, that as soon as we get the data, Google does patterns. We look at kind of what's um, similar, what's uh, related, um, and finding all sorts of ways to get that data extracting it from what little information we have in those um, object records. We try our best to come up with organizing principles, but they're our own. They're not the ones coming from the institution because the institution hasn't explicitly put them in the data. And you start seeing these bands of color and this visualization, but you're missing why the, the again, I'm sorry, I, I'm assuming too much. In the upper left, um, the Time Magazine covers begin, and in the bottom right are the, are the most recent ones. So you can see this kind of color banding happening in terms of slightly blue here, darker here, more white down at the bottom, um, switching between black and white and color images and then back to black and white briefly. But you don't have any of the, the context in terms of how did the design department change? What were the costs of printing and ink at the time? And you know all of this kind of falls away even though you've got this image that tells you, well, clearly in the 70s people were into blue things and in the 80s they liked black covers. I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that we would come back with um, using just the data. But we don't have the rest of the contextualizing content that the institutions haven't been able to provide. That organizing principle um, this is Project 90 by, by Song Dong uh, at the MoMA atrium. Um, he took his uh, mother's possessions out of the house that she had lived in with, her, with, his, with his father for the last 50 years um, after his death and kind of organized it in this kind of cathartic experience. <laughs> the fact that it's in the MoMA atrium is, is kind of interesting. But um, again, this organizing principle, this kind of um, laying everything out based on some sort of internal logic that was appropriate, but then trying to convey it um, to the audience is still something that we're struggling with on the technological side. And this impulse, this archival impulse, I think is something that um, you see in the audience um, that comes to the site. I mean, a feature that you saw quite frequently on individual museum websites was a user collections, kind of star your favorites sort of approach. And we have the same thing now, but across institutions something like half a million of them, but now only maybe about uh, 50,000, I think, are actually shared publicly. Um, whether or not people just start one and then never use it, or if they use it for class, or again, this is largely an education feature. It's just another thing that we're seeing that's kind of interesting, where people are providing their own organizing principles on top of that, 
and whether or not that could feed more of the institution's kind of technology decision. But when we do it, it's again, kind of this Rachel White Reed approach um, where we only see the edges, we only see kind of the, the negative space, right? We don't really understand, um, we, we can't interpret um, that much material. All we have are those, those bare data elements that are coming in. So when we come and visit an institution, we really do get the edges of it. We really just get the, the shape and scale, but we don't get any of the nuance. It's again, very blunt um, and all over, all at once. And that's uh, the best that we can do at this point. What happens then are these kinds of weird cases. This is an art project um, where a person has gone through and found the blurred, this was art project, I think still version one. An artist has gone through and found the blurred images for copyright reasons and found them, edited them out of the, uh, the street view imagery, sent them to China to have them reproduced as paintings and then showed them um, in full size in terms of what the size of the canvas was because you can know what object it was and then had them sent back to be shown in galleries basically. So this object was never in MoMA's collection but it is if you look at the street view. I mean, there's no way to know. I mean, above, well, from this anyway. Um, so it, this is a painting from MoMA, for, <laughs> uh, for example. <laughs> um, and you've got issues of copyright that pop up all the time for rightly or wrongly, where the experience of walking into this gallery is very different. Of course, of course it's first online, but walking into a, a gallery of blurred paintings with one sculptural object in the middle is, is a very different way of, of experiencing that space. Um, or vice versa in terms of understanding the architecture, but it's this massive obelisk that someone had to blur out. And again, just trying to understand what, the, what happens when the transformation of the collection. So this is the representation of the institution online. This is what people see. Um, this is how the museum is going to be interpreted and um, by an audience that potentially is much more uh, large and, and varied than the people who will actually be able to come and visit the institution. And this is what will stand for that museum. Um, and whether or not, it, of course, I'm, I'm hoping I'll get questions. <laughs> um, and then there's, of course, the issue of, of technological sort of failure and what that might mean. So there's uh, James Bridle and, and kind of the new aesthetic approach of, of looking at this content where these paintings could never physically exist. These, these little images with the, the gradient kind of blurring, it's because the stitching algorithm failed and you have these little stuttered um, connections between the images. So they only exist as, as these virtual images. So that's kind of interesting. So I've been <laughs> starting to think of us as um, the kind of Mark Dion citizen scientists kind of coming into the museums and trying to capture up what we can, um, kind of as best as we can, kind of well-intentioned, showing up with our gear and, and trying to really kind of represent that institution. But, ultimately ending up um, with a very kind of partial and, and strange representation, but something that more people will often see than the official documentation coming from the museum's website or of a physical gallery experience. It's something that gets transformed when it gets put online. And when that partnership happens with someone, whether it be Google or another tech sponsor or another funder, um, that these kinds of, of issues of transformation happen very frequently. And ultimately, we're just looking in on what that museum practice really is and how much can we interpret from outside. I mean, in terms of the, the Google tools can only do so much in terms of putting up the content and displaying the stories that the museums want to tell. But we're not yet at the point where um, we can kind of divine what those stories might be. And in that way, we're changing what those museums really are. So thank you. Fascinating, and I was just wondering. Uh, technically, it's uh, it's individuals going back in and uh, manually blurring all of the images. Yeah. Um, the questions about blurring and whether or not it's individuals. Absolutely. Um, they, uh, it's museum staff um, from various departments, but uh, that have to go through panorama by panorama 
and then decides uh, to blur the content. But it's basically a review tool where they can draw uh, a rectangle over an object and have that be blurred. We have to do it because um, they get baked into the imagery. We can't have access to, uh, to the copyrighted content anywhere on the Google servers. So we have to blur it out before it gets served. Would it be possible to put a lower pixel image in here as a substitute rather than blurring it out? That would, uh, the question was about um, replacing it with, yeah, replacing it with um, a lower pixel image. Oh, you mean overlaid into the street here? Yeah, it's not even so much that, it's that it, the image itself is just uh, protected regardless of resolution. Um, that they simply can't show it um, as a recognizable image um, online. The institutions just simply don't have the rights. I know there are a number of art museums that are using lower pixel uh, images and, and they're sort of exploring this fair use sure. clause in the copyright law. Yeah. And a number of institutions that, that have deemed these lower pixel thumbnails or, or so as, as acceptable. I mean, how big are these images? Are you using the same uh, line of reasoning to improve your in Street View, um, the, the question's about, again, um, just for recording purposes, the question's about in, uh, because of the fair use around smaller images, whether or not it would be possible to do that. Um, you're right, in terms of sm smaller images can be used on the individual websites, but within Street View, we can't control the resolution of the how far someone zooms in to that particular um, section. So if you replace that large, let's say, 5,000 pixels on the screen with a 640 by 480 you know, uh, image, it's not an experience that the institutions would really go for. But in terms of showing individual objects on their pages, then you're right, absolutely. Outside of the context of Street View, they are sharing. Our, our preference is for higher resolution images to give people something to zoom into and, and to spend some time on. But yes, I mean, we, we have reduced the, the image uh, dimensions requirements for archives, for example. Well, I'm going to pop in there and ask you because I was hoping, can you guys hear me if this working? Turn it for you. I'll go out to you now. <laughs> no, it's fine. Is it all right? Yeah. Okay. I was hoping copyright would come up. I made some notes on all the things that are happening in institutions, which I'm an art museum person, that condition and contain what can actually be presented, how it's presented, the yeah. data versus the storytelling. I was hoping copyright would come up. Mm -hmm. It has come up. Um, one of my colleagues that I talked to said, you know, Google Art might push us, might help push the copyright discussions. For example, in my institution, we were able to put up very little to none, no contemporary art. As a museum educator who started in post-contemporary art, modern art, and I love it, it's a, it's a loss and a problem for me that sure. it's underrepresented, you know. Um, could you comment on any aspect of, of copyright situation that we're in with particularly art museums? I think, uh, especially in the US and Canada and parts of Europe, it's absolutely still a, the biggest problem that we face in terms of getting um, breath from partners. Mm -hmm. Internationally, um, that is to say, uh, Japan, well, all of Asia really, um, even parts of Europe, and anywhere that the artist estate or the institution has had a good conversation with a living artist, um, those have been much more straightforward to, to see. Um, so quite a few South, South American and Asian institutions are putting up content without any seeming problems with copyright at all. And because they are going to the artists and the artists is, is part of this current world that we're living in? I, I honestly can't say. I mean, in terms of, we, we only ask again for the, for the institutions to be as conservative as they'd like with their selections. Right. And I can say that we haven't had any issues um, with those institutions posting that content, where if it was a U.S. institution, I imagine there would be quite a few additional hurdles to jump through. Um, you'll find that as a, as a complaint that we've heard many times from institutions, that um, they've chosen uh, the Whitney, for example, uh, only the material out of copyright, but of course most of their collection is more contemporary. Um, so it's very difficult for them to feel as if they're being accurately represented um, online because of these restrictions on, on what they can do with what they feel is their own content. Um, right, and beyond that, just the issues and approaches that Take to, sure. to life in the world of art that are often very different, very challenging to deal with the issues of our time, and then you're underrepresented. So that, that's where I come from as a 
those are certainly the conversations that are that are missing um, from the U.S. institutions around contemporary art. I can I can say that that's a gap uh, that we have. Any advice or hopes for us institutions? The web rights, um, building in uh, web promotion rights around contemporary images, and having um, artists and lenders feel comfortable sharing any kind of contemporary image for beyond the loan of a show or something like that would be incredibly helpful. They don't have to be gigapixel quality. We're just talking again about thumbnail size or, or better, but something that could actually stand for you know the last 50 years of, of, of image history, which just is lacking. Um, I'll turn it back over to the audience, but I wanted to comment that I think it addresses very much, there are many areas where you address indirectly or directly current museum practices and how those practices might need to evolve our data, our thinking about contemporary art. And in my own institution, we're starting to talk differently about what kinds of permissions do we have to get for anything we do sure. in order to really be in the modern world <laughs> you know, that we're living in. So anyway, I'll turn it back over to people that might have uh, questions or queries. I have a non-copyright one, but if you want to follow the copyright question line first, I'll wait. No, 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 please. We, no, can, we can pop around. Divining the story. Yeah. Mm. That's the real power of what's here. And, and be direct. Are you looking for a small case? Because we have one where I've recruited a graduate incoming student in statistical analysis to help us just deal with several hundred objects that we digitize to look at because the data we have behind it is we try to figure the driving cultural issues with it. It's probably a visual analysis going to be way better than all the statistical manipulation we're doing. Yeah. And I just bring that up. I suspect there are other museums that might have small case studies within it of several hundred objects, thousands of pieces of data where we've got it together. We're just going, but it probably has something to do with, say, French fashion design and nothing to do with the medium of which we're in, which in my case is an ornamental garden. No, I, I think the tightly curated collections are the ones that we can do the best job of trying to figure out whether a machine could do it at all. Um, but honestly, the, the nuance of a well-curated or a well-told kind of story is something that I, I've personally not seen anything that will be able to, to do as effective as, as an effective. I'd love to talk. I think we may have an example here. Okay. You <laughs> I was wondering, what are the constraints for public museums versus private museums? And for example, if you're taking something uh, in a public museum, how is that different from taking an image on a public street, a, a, a work of art in a public park? Are, are do copyright laws apply in that situation? We have to take a very conservative line um, as Google, um, and we rely on the institutions and their degree of comfort um, whether or not they can post an image. So where you, your line of questioning about whether or not this, if it's a public institution and it's a public piece of art or you know, the, the kind of image they take, even if it followed either the letter or the spirit of copyright, if the institution doesn't feel comfortable, we can't do anything with it, and that's just um, in terms of policy. Um, our preference, of course, the more the, the merrier, but at the same time, that conservative sort of nature of especially US institutions um, kind of constrains what we can do. I have a question on quality assurance sure. and if this is sustainable. So the stitching algorithm, the state yeah. that you showed, is it on the institutions to go through and ensure that, they're, that everything's displayed properly, or is it on your team? We, but the, those kinds of stitching problems have gone away as we've evolved um, kind of the algorithms, but absolutely it's up to us to come up with the technology that's good enough, and if the institution doesn't like any of those panoramas, they can reject them for out of hand. How long does that process take then? Sure. Before? How long does the process take? It depends on, well, how many panoramas and how much square footage we've really photographed. Um, so the Getty, for example, was a few thousand images, whereas um, smaller galleries can be 50 photographs. And it really just depends on how much staff time they're willing to devote and just to give, whether or not that stitch problem gives such a bad experience or that blurred gallery gives such a bad experience that they don't want to provide it at all is really, there's so many different questions in that 
um, obviously that, that sculptural piece was important enough that, or the donor or the lender or the, you know, for whatever reason it was important enough to still include even if all of the other pieces had to be blurred. So again, it, it, it's down to the institution, but it's just a question of flipping through potentially thousands of photographs and deciding whether or not they're good enough. Uh, thanks for a, a really good talk. Um, I've got a bit of a sort of a Pandora's boxy question. Um, why? What are Google's motivations for doing this? I mean, it's and, and no, it's I mean, it, I mean, it's and oftentimes, you know, because Google produces a lot of you know public stuff, you know, sure. tools, um, which are an enormous business. You know, so, what are the sort of speak to the motivations? This was something that I was, of course, concerned about. I'm switching from the nonprofit side of the museum world and switching over to, to Google. It was also kind of strange um, at first. The altruistic component, as hokey as it sounds, the organizing the world's information part really does drive a lot of it. Um, because also Google works in as many different countries as it does, and because the time scale that they're concerned with and um, the resources that they have at present uh, are, are so vast, that they can think about perhaps soft impact um, across the world rather than immediate monetary gains. And to be seen, that's another reason for the non-monetizing components to the project. I mean, one of the initial criticisms of, that we had to get over was that we were trying to make money where the institutions couldn't, like in image licensing or reproductions or all the rest of it. Again, no ads, no, you know, no printing, no rights transfer, all of those issues had to be handled. Because of that, more and more institutions kind of felt comfortable with the idea, and we were able to grow in other countries, in other sorts of kinds of content that people are looking for. And ultimately, we're, because of that, Google is getting access to more of those paper, print, 3D, you know, painting archive content, you know, repositories that otherwise wouldn't be online at all. So more of that is getting online because of that. So it's, it, of course, there's you know, intangible sort of soft benefits, especially around the world, but that organizing information part is still very much really what's motivating a lot of it. Question, um, the expansion in terms of new institutions coming into the Cultural Institute is really striking. I'm wondering if you could say more about what's happened to institutions that have been there from early on, and are there provisions to refresh relationships? What happens if they get their metadata in order. I'm very curious to see, you know, many of them, ones I've looked at seem to be very highly selective, you know, thousands of, of objects that they have, but maybe 60 are there. So, you know, and I guess I'm just curious, what, what does it look like? Until, until recently, um, and hopefully in the next few months, we'll be adding uh, features to the site that'll make it more attractive than just an image kind of holding pen, um, but there's gonna be other ways to actually um, interact with that material. Um, so to make the institute, entice the institutions to kind of use it in different ways. Um, because currently, you're right, I mean, it, it, the growth has been pretty effective up until now, and the organization has worked for 500 institutions, but it's certainly the alphabetical list and a map won't work for a few thousand institutions. I mean, that, the, the scale issue will, will become something that the interface will have a problem with. We have gone back and refreshed um, some of the imagery from the first round, that street view that we work very happy with, that we've been able to improve on. Um, and institutions can post at any point in terms of it's just like Flickr or YouTube where they can um, just log in to their administrative dashboard and add more content um, and you know refresh the material and, and correct any typos or, or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I think currently the site acts pretty well as a static repository. But the hope is that we're through the storytelling tools and a few other things that we're now making it a little bit more engaging for the institution. Hey Peter, um, I have a, a question that's trying to abstract a little bit from the conversation so far. So I think what a lot of the questions have been about is are the inherent limitations that you're facing because of the conservative nature of museums uh, in their interpretation of copyright and in other areas. And the results of that are um, policies you've needed to adapt for the no printing, no downloading of the artworks. Um, and of course, so those go against the grain of the internet as it functions, right? Um, you, you basically are forced to create a dead end, in a sense, where you can see the stuff, but 
you are limited in your ability then to make use of it in the ways you might want to make use of it. And that's not a criticism of Google Art, that's really, I'm, I want to backtrack from that to the institutional behavior, to the museum behavior, to the museums you, you work with. And in order to intervene in that behavior, we need a carrot, right? We need some kind of compelling argument that says, this is so important that you as a museum community need to reevaluate how you think about this stuff. Within a legal paradigm, obviously, we're not asking anybody to break the law, but you need to reevaluate how you're thinking about things like copyright and your comfort level with letting things go. I'd be very interested in hearing you paint the very, very big picture vision of what would be possible if museums were to open up a little bit more. You know, give us that, put that big carrot in the middle of the room for us. Um, you would be able to have images much more quickly on, in more contexts right away. So your phones, your tablets, display technology, um, backgrounds on TVs, and I mean anywhere that these images could live, if there was a way to secure um, either the attribution of the content or to keep its use tracked effectively with analytics or whatever else it might be, to have the institutions understand where and, and in what context their images are being used globally, and to have that being fed back to the institutions, I think would be probably the biggest care that I can for, you know, see from a technical perspective. That if we could actually say, if you do open up your images, we'll be able to come up with a technology, and we don't have one, I promise, to track the use of all of that content everywhere, um, and then have those institutions be able to understand their audience that much better because of it, rather than having to say, we only know the traffic that comes to our website, or the, the few silos of content that we've created online that are sanctioned, but rather, you know, this is all of the different ways that our images are being used. And the Rights Museum, I think, is the best example of this. I mean, the, they just partnered with Etsy to share their images for the Etsy community to be able to use all of their content in producing material and products. And there, the, our, the line that was fantastic from the director was, if they're going to be using our images, they might as well be using the official ones, or the, the ones that are coming from us. And I think that's where the technical solution might be the most helpful. The tracking use and understanding audience, I think, is the, the carrot there. I think I'd like to add a couple of other issues that in fact, I think that it's not only the conservatism of museums and the current copyright laws, but it's also the problems, but people are always shocked uh, when they come into art museums and they learn how patchy our data actually is. Because our collections have grown haphazardly often over time. We have haphazardly or with changing standards catalog them. We have, and then new technologies have appeared that make standardized keywording or intelligent keywording suddenly move from a nice thing to a critical thing. And I know at UMA, we got a grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. It allowed us to properly keyword and describe with the help of many graduate students and our curators, 2,000 objects. We have 19,000. I mean, we're not that big compared to some of the museums you're dealing with. So the labor that it took to address a portion of our collection was staggering. And in fact, I made notes during your talk that this could be a full employment program for museums, everyone. <laughs> Get out and vote. <laughs> we need more people because the knowledge that we can produce. And so another answer that I would give about the carrot in the long run is, the, is knowledge. That it, it, when there's more there and there's more data there, and, and I love the micro photography. That's really exciting. I think new knowledge could be produced by through those means, new comparisons from scholars nowhere near each other. Very exciting. And then lastly, I think something that isn't fully being plumbed yet by a lot of our technology, which is what is the social experience? You know, I have a lot, a 16 year old, he shows me a lot of things on the internet. There's a lot of wow, but I feel like we're still getting to the so what. And that's normal. We're on a, a curve. So those are the comments that I wanted to add into the discussion as a museum long-time museum person, passionate about learning and what can happen, and, and also the social experience that can, could happen in our buildings and, and online. I think from the, the social side in particular, we, we benefited from being one of the first kind of highlighted Google Plus pages that you could favorite when you signed up to Google Plus. 
so our audience is now about nine and a half million people um, to the art project, for example. Like, so whenever we post something, those nine and a half million people let them find out. As to why it's nine and a half million, probably because they want to display the fact that they're into art to all of their other people, not just you know fast cars and soccer teams or whatever. And yeah, it, it's totally we're in the race always for the top spot with like Angry Birds and Coldplay and <laughs> FC Barcelona, I think it was. So there's always like that social component that whenever there's a, a video that we can post or something like that, we can find 100 people out of that 9 million that will want to see it. And are, well, already that's more than most museum auditoriums will handle. So they're, they're more than happy to, to build up on that, that social component. And, and speaking about social and maybe pushing or inquiring into that definition of um, social participation through being a node, in a network versus other kinds of imaginings about what the social might be. Do you have any further thoughts or, or hopes about what might develop? I think we're kind of at the beginning of understanding in some ways of what yeah. social could be. I'm most uh, kind of optimistic around the connections that we're able to make across institutions that aren't there. There's a, an American painting show at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. They weren't able to secure all the loans that they wanted physically for the show but they were able to um, get those loans virtually through the art project, so they were able to uh, make an exhibit um, and pull that content from those other institutions, at least the, the images, what the exhibit might have been if we would have had all of the pieces that we wanted. But those kinds of social connections, when collections start becoming uh, uh, something you can, more malleable online and something that can actually be interacted with across institutions, I think would be kind of interesting. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my question is kind of getting back to the stories and the context mm -hmm. of the art. You know, there's the uh, virtual exhibition, and can you have uh, you know multiple stories tied to works of art so that you can have uh, you know, different viewpoints on the same piece and share some of the the context of how the art would be shown in the museum around that work? Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, the street view is just the one time that we managed to go through the gallery, so that seems to be the one moment that you can capture what it actually looks like uh, in the space. But in terms of the stories, there's no limit on the number of templated exhibits you can build. And it's, you know, again, painfully simple to put that together. I mean, you, you, you want to build more uh, of those exhibits once you've done the first one for exactly that reason. But the trouble is you, you run into lack of, of interpretive content really quickly that you have, okay, the, the one, the tour for kids, you've got the director's highlights tour, you've got maybe one or two others that are focused for K through 12 or, you know, however it happens to be, and then those interpretations quickly kind of fall off in terms of how many ways has the institution vetted their content to be posted online in the first place. So we'd love to see more, and I think this is where the user galleries are generating that content on their own. They go through the collections and they find, you know, the best uh, cigars and photographs, or you know, funny hats, or you know, silly ones, but ones that are idiosyncratic and, and kind of interesting, but a, a different viewpoint on the collection. And it's just something that we can't we can't just ex extract it where it isn't there. So, I, I wonder if I might guess where you might be taking things next. Um, one of the biggest hurdles that I'm finding right now for the in gallery experience is a trigger uh, to provide. Uh, okay, um, so <laughs> glad you went down that way because I can actually talk about that one. Um, the image recognition, we had uh, Google goggles built in um, to the content that you post to the Cultural Institute. So if you do take a photograph of an object anywhere, you know, a, a book cover, a, a bus driving by, whatever it happens to be, it'll let you know that that object is on the Cultural Institute and it'll point you back to the official museum web page as well as the Cultural Institute page. So in terms of image recognition, um, we can certainly do that. Um, the glass experience, that's something that the glass team is, is certainly interested in, and we have kind of had those conversations. Finding institutions that are comfortable with that is also a bit of a, a strain. I mean, it, um, Could you say what that is for uh, Google, people that aren't as, I mean, yeah. not Google Glass basically, sure. but what you mean by comfortable with that? What's yeah. the practice you're describing? Um, of, well, of wearing technology and always having uh, a recording device, essentially, um, that could passively uh, kind of record the environment. 
there's still indicators, obviously, of when it's being recorded and so on. But um, in galleries that don't have, you know, clear cell phone policies, so when it's you can pull out your smartphone to take a photograph of a QR code versus taking a photograph when there's no photography allowed in the gallery, it's kind of hard to do. So glass just ups that uh, another degree, um, and there's you know issues of, of public privacy, whether or not people will feel comfortable uh, with the glass experience in a public environment that way. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Overlaying additional artwork information, thinking about how we can pull up uh, related content from uh, the gallery that's <coughs> not up on the wall and then putting it virtually kind of, you know, just off the side of another object. Oh, well, of course, those kinds of things are, are, we're speculating on those, but we're still trying to put together all the pieces. longevity of the project. This has come up with incredible rapidity. And I'm thinking here of the Library of Alexandria, which was an amazing, wonderful institution that caused a lot of wonderful things to happen in scholarship. And the thing that people know the most about it now is that it's gone. And that's a very charitable <laughs> description. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think the, the bit about it, the non-exclusive component. We're not um, asking people to generate data that's only going to be living on the Cultural Institute. There's a big blue export button um, on the dashboard. You can export your data at any time as an XML file or as a CSV. All of the images are coming from the institutions anyway. So we've done a good thing in that we've put it all together in one spot and we've managed to coordinate the efforts because we're so big um, to, of all those institutions. But we're not asking for anything that doesn't actually exist already. Um, and it's just that because we're able to, to bring it all together is that it, that it does seem as impressive as it is. And are institutions able to take their materials back down and totally. get it in? Yeah, they can export, they can um, take the content down if they have to, they can share it with other institutions. We'd be eager for them to start sharing their, their data more widely. Um, we don't restrict that at all. It's just that the institutions often don't have anywhere else to go with their data. Um, so we've been talking to other, um, you know, the Europeanas and DPLAs of the world to kind of figure out whether or not we can, you know, even share more widely. Um, it just depends on the how comfortable, again, the institutions that have signed up with the Cultural Institute, whether or not they feel comfortable showing up everywhere else. So again, it's that inherent conservatism sometimes that holds us back. Hi, uh, thank you for your <coughs> fascinating presentation over here. Sorry, thank you. <coughs> I had a question about the private-public issue, and I noticed that on the project site, there are some large municipal and public collections that are not on there, like the National Gallery or the DIA, the Detroit Institute. Sure. Um, are there reasons why they haven't joined up, or are they planning to? Or I noticed that there are some Smithsonian museums, but not all of them, and that type of thing. Uh, well, National Gallery is there, so the, the one in DC, anyway, and the one in London. So. But uh, hopefully, yeah, as of yesterday, anyway. Um, the DIA, we've been talking to them forever. Um, I think it's, it, some institutions just have uh, the realities and uh, constraints of being a physical and running a physical museum. Sometimes they just don't have time or the wherewithal to deal with one more digital project. And I think that's been kind of the largest barrier to entry at this point. Um, the distinction with public institutions, sometimes they have uh, their small legal points about whether or not they can accept the, the laws of another state or something like that, and you know small modifications that we have to make to our standard agreement at this point. But really, um, the agreement right now works for as many institutions as you see online. So we, it really boils down to whether the institution has the staff and has the material ready. You'd be surprised how many large institutions, either by size of collection or audience, don't have digitized content or you know, don't have it cataloged very well. Um, so they have enough that they can keep it the two or three percent of the objects that they have in the galleries versus the, the rest of the content that's off view. They have that well documented, but when we say we can show everything, then they balk at the idea. Um, but yeah, in the Smithsonian case, I think we're getting closer to a, to a group agreement. I think various institutions, just depending on whether or not they were ready with their material and how uh, free they were, they were to work within the broader Smithsonian sort of family, um, they were able to join. And I think uh, many other government agencies are, are coming on board as well. So.
think we have time for a couple more questions, and then we'll try to wrap up uh, this interesting session. Are, are most of the institutions that are joining ones where they already have their own website uh, that uh, you know, allows searchable uh, use of their collections? I guess I'm wondering, are there any institutions that are opting to just go with Google and not do their own website? So the question is about um, the web readiness of some of the institutions, whether or not they already have this functionality, and this is just an add-on. Uh, or they go with you or they as, exclusively as, as Google. Their, yeah. uh, we have a few cases like that, especially internationally with the smaller institutions, where they have some web presence. So a page that shows opening hours and you know history of the institution, but they don't have a web an image viewer, or they don't have you know exhibition tool. I think the, the Hungarian Literary Museum, for example, is a good case where they have information about the, the site, but they don't have any content on their own website. Um, that they have it digitized, but haven't figured out a way to, uh, to host it on their own site. So in that respect, we are in the destination for some of that material, and the only place we could you could find some of that. Uh, most of the larger institutions, we ask them to point back to the object web pages, the, the ones that are back on that site, always expecting the most up-to-date content to be back on the partner site, rather than on the cultural institute. Um, so the larger museums, the ones with the more technical wherewithal, they always have um, an established website. But I think internationally, especially with some of the smaller institutions, um, that we certainly enhance their web presence. Hi. Um, my question, kind of going along with what he was saying, as well as uh, a few of the things you were talking about earlier with um, analytics and that kind of thing, um, for a lot of institutions, including um, the Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum at Michigan State University, by the way, um, we, we're concerned with, um, largely for tracking purposes, driving traffic back to our site, just so for informational purposes. Um, what kind of integration is available with this? And I, having it all is there is great, but if we want our site to be a destination for information about us, it, how they fit together on all that. Just um, the analytics, uh, if you have a Google Analytics account, we send all of the traffic that goes to your section of the art project back to you, back to that ID, so you can create reports on just your Google uh, Cultural Institute section. Um, your idea about destination, I think that might be an opinion that's changing a little bit in terms of some institutions are happy just to get their content out, and wherever people see it, they count it as a visitor and they count it as traffic. Um, if you think about how many, if you always had to rely on people knowing to go to your website, I mean, it's not the same as having to expect only counting the physical visitorship and having them be only, that's the only audience we care about. I mean, I'm not suggesting that's, that's your approach, but if you're just thinking about that, the, the fact that you're online in many different places, that is your destination. Your destination is your content, not your domain. Um, and I think that's something that, that might be changing a little bit in, in terms of people's thinking. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We're, every All the tracking we do, we get back to the institution. Is there any method for um, sort of dis displaying content from our project on other things? Or is it all just, you know, I mean, you, YouTube is a great example, I think, in that it, you can go to YouTube and find all this stuff and you have your search and find related in a, content. In a, in a dark corner in the hallway and we'll talk. Okay. I'm just curious. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question actually follows up on that one. Has anyone else been thinking of, about the fact that um, museum exhibits, real world exhibits, curated exhibits might be dying? It might be a form that we're seeing the end of. I'm beginning to think that with the rise of social media, social connectedness, that actually curated museum exhibits might be dinosaurs. And as um, Google pro progresses further, and as you can find content anywhere, and you don't actually have to go to a museum to see an exhibit. I don't know, it's just something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, just really quick on both points about both, you asked about the website uh, traffic, and also about the physical experience. Anecdotally, um, the visitors that come to the art project and find a museum, and then travel to that museum's web pages, they end up spending more time on that museum's pages than the average visitor to that museum. So we tend to find the high quality web traffic that then goes to that institution. And when it comes to physical exhibits, 
I, this is certainly not meant to replace any kind of physical experience. If anything, what we've, again, anecdotally, we've been hearing that it's enticing more physical visitorship the more online content we provide. People have a better sense of what's in the collection, and they have a better sense of what the experience would be when they actually go to the institution. Um, and in some cases, even for preservation purposes, people are hoping to decrease physical visitorship in some you know, historic homes and, and, and sites by using these tools. So uh, it really, it's not, I, I wouldn't say they're dying. I think that the experience is just going to be very different when you show up physically. If, if we can replicate something, not equivalent, but an interesting physical, uh, online virtual experience, the physical experience just has to change. I don't know if it'll die, but it certainly change. I'll just echo that as we wrap up to say that um, I think it's just one more factor if museums take into account really who our visitors are today, what it is to have a global audience. It's going to change our physical offerings and our physical experience that we offer, and it should, in my opinion. Otherwise, we're putting our head in the sand and trying to live in the 19th century. So, you know, um, Peter, any last words? We're going to wrap up this session. No, thank you. And, Thank, um, join me in thanking Peter. <laughs>